Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, event uh, on Sunday evening uh, for the Classics Now Festival. This is uh, the opening weekend of what we hope will be a series of events um, exploring um, artistic um, engagement, re-engagement and reinterpretation and recreation of uh, the literature, arts and ideas of uh, the Greeks and Romans. Um, and this event is focusing on theater. Um, we've had, we've had a, earlier, we've had uh, a look at Antigone um, in various forms. And today we are probably focusing more on, on her father, uh, Oedipus. And, and that'll be one of the things we're going to talk about. I'd like to introduce our two guests this evening. Um, the playwright Marina Carr, who is one of Ireland's leading dramatists, who is an award-winning writer. Her, who, her work has been translated and uh, performed all over the world. And she has, her work has returned time and time again to the Greek myths um, and her own interpretations and versions of them um, and of, to Greek tragedy. Um, in, and she has returned particularly to, to the women of Greek tragedy in including um, Medea and Electra. She's also um, been drawn to Aeschylus Orestian trilogy, the Oresteia. And in her new work, which will be performed next year, we hope, uh, for a live audience on the stage, it's, she's, she's looking at the myth of Oedipus, the story of Oedipus, the cursed king of Thebes, and his wretched children, including Antigone. Um, and she's joined this evening by director Katrina McLaughlin, who's actually has worked with, with Marina many times before and is herself an award-winning director. She's associate director at the Abbey, where she directed Marina's play on Rapture's Hill. Um, and she's also worked with in opera. She's worked in New York um, and she's originally from Donegal. And we thought it would be wonderful to bring Katrina as director and Marina as playwright together um, and to, to talk about the Greeks, the myths, the tragedies, how, how you bring those to the stage and what, and what it all means. <laughs> That's what we're going to try. So uh, welcome to you both. Um, it's lovely to have you here. I am going to uh, leave the two of you to have a conversation um, on your own. Um, and I will come back in later and maybe add a few add a few thoughts of my own and uh so that's the format and so i'm katrina i'm going to hand over to you and uh see you in a bit thank you thank you thanks helen hi marina <laughs> hi katrina how are you very good um so i suppose the best place to start is what it, what does it mean to you what does a classic mean to you what do you respond to or what do you first come to when you think classic play, classic myth? Mm, that's kind of, I'm not sure what I, what I respond to. Um, I suppose firstly, um, while I read uh, the plays over and over again, uh, very often it'd be the myth behind the play that would be it, it would have as much of a pull for me as the the play itself um, and and the wonderful thing about all these Greek myths is there are so many versions of them so they can have several beginnings and several endings so you can there's lots to play around with and um, the plays themselves because I'm not a Greek scholar so I'm reduced to reading them in translation and we know there are many translations of, of the Greek plays um, uh, some better than others and some uh, you know they they change they seem to change with the decades and with the centuries um, so I suppose when I when I look at a classic I'm looking for the hard lines the hard wiring of the story and um, and how I can kind of riff on that and play around with that I mean, what do you, when you think of a classic, what do you, what comes to your mind? I suppose my initial response 
to even the term is a, is a bit wider. If I, you know, you know, I think of classic plays as Shakespeare, Ibsen, Chekhov, as much as I think of the Greeks. Mm. When I when I think about plays, I suppose from the ancient world, I I have come to the myths through the plays, if you know what I mean. So I'm slightly backways in engaging with them, and for me, it's always the the thing that always catches me is some is the dilemma, the personal human dilemma at the center of the Greek plays. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something like, I suppose, Medea or Iphigenia, Iphigenia, however you want to say it, mm -hmm. the, the human story, the fact that I suppose, I suppose I look at it very much in terms of when it was happening and why we were looking at these questions on stage at the time and what we were trying to discover about what a human being is, how a human being feels, how, where the morality sits. Do you, you know, is there a, are you adhering or uh, thinking about a kind of higher plane or a human dynamic? Mm. Or is, it a, is it in relation to a, a God's judgment or your peers judgment so with, I suppose I and for that reason I, one of the first plays I kind of think about and engage with um, is probably Iphigenia mm. um, coming so coming to because and I suppose because it's easier for me or it was when I came to Greek plays first to engage with the idea of what it must feel like for a father to have to kill his daughter or for a daughter to be killed by her father than to engage with Oedipus say and the, and the complexity of the idea at the center of that play. Mm. Mm. So what was it drew, drew you to revisiting Oedipus now? Oh my God, what a question. <laughs> uh, partly I've kind of done all the others. <laughs> this is the last <laughs> one. Um, also, uh, I suppose the whole theme of incest I find fascinating. Mm. And th the whole idea of what everybody knows and the idea. Interesting. Uh, one of the things well, I love about the Greeks is they that again. Kind of do exactly what they do. You dropped out a little bit there. Um, you were saying right. what right. everyone knows. You were just saying um, what everyone knows in terms of, you know, coming to the play and the subject of incest and what everyone knows about that. And then we lost you. Oh, uh, God, I can't even remember what I said. Okay, I suppose let me let me let me try it, go again then. Um, I suppose what drew me to Oedipus was, um, well, firstly, I've kind of done all the other big ones. Like I've done a Bog of Cats, I've done Medea, I've done Phaedra, I've done a play about Phaedra, I've done a play about Clytemestra. Um, and I hadn't done Jocasta, so, I, so she kind of fascinates me. And as was one of the big questions in Oedipus is around, I mean, people talk about the prophecy and they talk about destiny versus free will and all, all of that. But what I find interesting about Oedipus is the lying. Mm. Who has the knowledge and who has the half knowledge and the things that we know and bury or the things we half know and the things we choose not to know about ourselves. I think it's a wonderful play on that. Um, because I think they're all withholding knowledge from themselves and from each other. And I think there are, um, there are great recognition moments in, in Oedipus, uh, in the Oedipus Jocasta relationship, all there to play for. Um, all there that, that Sophocles himself touches on very, very lightly and passes over, but they are there nevertheless. And I suppose one of the interesting questions around Oedipus as well is, um, the handling of Jocasta, uh, you know, down the centuries. Yeah. Uh, you know, that she, she is the innocent victim, that she, you know, that she unwittingly marries her son and has all these incestuous children. 
Um, I think that's too easy, to be honest. I think she's far more complex than that. I also think Oedipus is far more complex than, you know, the party line that um, he's fulfilling the prophecy and um, that it doesn't matter really what he does, that he's going to end up killing his father and marrying his mother. So there is, um, I think there's huge, there are huge shadowy areas that are fantastic kind of um, palettes for, for a contemporary playwright to, to you know, um, explore mm -hmm. and to try and think what, what, what does, what does how these people behave how, how does that translate in into now or is it is it a story that could only come out of a cave is it a cautionary tale is it um is it about the kind of the birth of evolution and is it kind of is it a story about genetics um is it a story about um the freudian undercurrent that we're all meant to carry within us uh, the passions around the mother, the passions around the father and what they are for the child, what that connection, that bond gets messed with or, or thwarted in some way. Okay, yeah. So when you came to write The Boy, did you come to any conclusions? Not really, no, no. Um, but I, I mean, it was it was a fabulous journey. Um, I mean, we don't really want to. No, no. Play. Yeah. No, but I'm just thinking about what you're saying there in terms of choices and the, what we decide to reveal and what we decide to keep and. I suppose I was thinking about it in terms of the idea of fate in that and mm -hmm. what you were thinking about in terms of that a sort of fatalistic drive towards a, a, an ultimate conclusion. Do you, do you think, do you think the choices impact on the conclusion or do you in general now i'm not talking about the boy but in general in terms of greek and the greek plays and the greek myths and the idea of fate such a huge question isn't it you know free will versus destiny i mean i think we all like to think we have a bit of free will but actually comes down to it you know you begin at a certain age you begin to sound like your mother or your father <laughs> yes. and you begin to look like them um and, and you wonder how much genetically you are, you are programmed. And then you wonder, you wonder in the, is the universe, you know, is it all random or is there a beautiful design there that we're just too dim to see or we're not evolved enough to see? Um, what, are the, what are the connections in the world? What are the connections? What's the pattern in our lives? Um, you know, Yeats talks about this, if we could find the myth that was our myth then our life would be explained i'm paraphrasing now and um, maybe helen will find the exact quote um but the idea that that there there are, there is a hard wiring that's almost like your your birth gift um you know you're you, it's almost like going back to you know before the the weaver's throne and uh, they weave out the carpet of your life and you turn your back and they they pull a stitch and you don't see what that stitch is that's been pulled. And then you turn back and they, who is, it's not Manismi, but whoever it is weaves the carpet, gives it to you. And that, that slip stitch or that pull stitch is your kind of your Achilles heel or it's mm. your destiny or yeah. it's the thing that is going to shape your life. Um, which of course you don't know until it, it has happened probably, or maybe you have intimations about it. But I suppose that going back to Oedipus, that's the, the fantastic power of Oedipus, I think, is that it's it's the knowing and the unknowing aligned and, and, and going uh, one's life knowing and half knowing. Say that again, uh, Marina. The going through ones, it's the the fascinating thing about Oedipus, or one of the fascinating things, is the going, 
is is the the knowing and the not knowing right and i think that's why it's still such a compelling story for us all and mm -hmm. um, because we we recognize instinctively that thing in ourselves that that knowing and not knowing thing or that knowing and half knowing or that that absolute knowledge and that absolute denial going you know hand in hand that's something actually that's really interesting um because that's what makes great drama anyway isn't it that that space for the audience to decide if the character how much a character knows and that space to be informed in your own thinking by watching something like that yeah i would think so um yeah i think you you absolutely do need to leave that that gap and i suppose that's the power of of live theater that communal thing which we're all missing terribly right now i know, you know online is not doing it for us um mm. and it is that magical thing and it's i suppose it's 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 what it is to be human and um, to sit in groups and to talk and to laugh and to weep and uh to share and and the idea that we are that we are connected in our humanity um, and when, when, when you go into isolation or because of certain circumstances um, when that can't be expressed, that kind of space becomes diminished. And I think with that diminishment of communication um, and that isolation, there, there starts to be a paring down of, of thinking yeah. and feeling. And I think that is very, very damaging for yeah. all of us. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. But I, I, and I think that is something that has been happening for quite a while, actually. Yeah, this points it up. The, this last year has really, yeah. Um, yeah, it has brought this question, I think, yeah, it has brought this question to the fore. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is, what is the purpose of, of a Greek myth or a play like Oedipus or a play like Medea? Or what is the purpose of, of theatre? Why, why should we be reading these old things or seeing these old things or going back to them? Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I have no answers for that, except I do because I love them. Um, I don't know, why, why do you keep going back to the old stories, to the classics, whether it's Shakespeare or Ibsen or, or Sophocles? Um, I, think, I think it's got something to do with that idea of where, where there's space in it for an audience to figure something out in themselves. And I think that classics, uh in general um offer us a, a, offer us insight into ourselves we might be watching a play unfold in front of us but we definitely learn something about about the human psyche or about our own psychology watching them where i think because there is this kind of dilemma this question this you know, space is the, is the best way for me to describe it for an, for, for an audience. Mm. And you're sitting there, and I think because you're sitting there in company and you're experiencing, you're experiencing a dilemma that individuals in that company will have different views on and will come down on different sides of. Mm. And I think the classic plays do this for us, I mean, I mean, that's what they were designed to do in a way. I suppose they were they were designed originally to help us understand what kind of a society we wanted to make, how to build a democracy, how to make choices about what was a, a, a human um, moral choice and what was, I suppose, something that we needed to ask to a higher power for. But I think that we, we a lot of contemporary theatre that I read now has, almost spells almost tells us what to think too much mm. and um it doesn't leave it doesn't leave us to do any work mm. so i and and i find when you you can go back to these texts 
and you can come at them from every angle and every time you take a different angle or you come at them from the perspective of a different character they open up a whole other world of conversation of dilemma of drama um i mean it's endless to me you know um yeah. with I wonder, the, I'm, sorry um no, I'm sorry. Sorry. I wonder what what you think or where you are on you know the tragic impulse um and you know it may seem it may seem you know well these days it seems really not kosher to to celebrate the tragic impulse because we're in the era of happiness and uh, we're all meant to be happy <laughs> yeah. and we're meant to pursue happiness um and we're meant to want uh things to work out for it which is a very human thing as well but i suppose the other thing the, the death instinct or the tragic impulse um which i think are, are similar enough um that that's i think as much in play in us as the the wish for happiness and the good life yeah. and i think we're not allowed we're not allowed to grieve our own lives anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that we have to be healthy, we have to do this, we have to, because to be happy, there are all these rules you have to obey to be happy. Yeah. Uh, you know? um, and actually, actually, life is inherently tragic. Yeah. We're all going to, we're all only going the one way. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. <laughs> it's so true um what's that i'm trying to remember what's that quote um what's that quote uh from emerson that's like something like the greatest tragedy of our times is the fact that we're all getting older <laughs> like the only great tragedy of our time is the fact that we can't prevent aging it's something like that that we mm. can't stop aging that we can't control death <laughs> but it's but, but to me, because we are in this superficial world at the moment where we are presenting a version of reality that is not, um, that is not true, mm. I think tragedy is even more important. I think that we have like one of the great gifts of watching tragedy, reading tragedy, experiencing it in a in a distant form through play or a film or a book, um, is that you learn, you somehow, you know, that idea that you practice it, that you, you know, that idea that you practice the loss for when it happens, that you start to get a hint into the sensation of what that loss is or what that tragedy feels like mm. so that you have the capacity to cope with it when it does come yeah i think that's wonderful because you know it's ridiculous to think that you that you just die at the end yeah. you know, like living dying dying is a process um and and the other thing about you know that to judge everything by the end is is a false premise too yeah you know you could have had you could have a great life and then maybe the last year or two is not great but does that make your life tragic apart from the fact that you're human and you have to go the way of all flesh mm -hmm. um but the idea of of dying into life and i think it's um the greeks are fantastic on that they were very uh very eloquent and articulate mm. on, on on the passing of, of the ages and the and the role of of mystery in our lives um now having said that i have a huge problem with the greek choruses as you <laughs> well know <laughs> yes. so do you <laughs> well i was just thinking about that as you were talking about it i was thinking about the old men of thebes <laughs> yeah um uh, yeah Talk a little bit more about your problem with the chorus. I just don't have them there. I, I well, the one I think one of the problems it's not my problem. It's that nobody actually knows what they did. Yeah. You know, they apparently they sang and they danced and they had very precise movements and uh, harmonies and whatever. But we don't know what that is. It's just not left to us. Mm. Um, 
but I think I mean in spirit in spirit I love them and I would incorporate when I write I would incorporate their feeling and their concerns and their lyricism I love and mm-hmm. um, because I think tragedy is absolutely aligned with the lyric impulse you know the tragic mm-hmm. impulse and the lyric impulse I think they are they are very much um combined that kind of heightened articulation of of who we are and what we've lost um and, and the chorus sometimes serve that function but i just can't take the i suppose anytime i've seen uh i've seen i have never seen a chorus work on stage so yeah. i tend to just get rid of them or uh everyone's their own chorus yeah do you know what i sometimes wonder if you were coming to these stories for the first time and there you had never encountered like when you think about coming to see one of these stories being sung or told to you and having no encounter with the notion of a father killing her daughter his daughter or a mother discovering her husband as her son i wonder uh, is there something in this spacing out of the information um the kind of light because there's a sense that they wear on in some cases a bit of light relief almost or a distraction from the drive of the story and i wonder did they did they need them to tell the ex you know to tell stories in such an extreme or such extreme stories of because the emotional effect of these stories and hearing them in front of people uh thousands of people and maybe never hearing some of it before um or or even hearing the idea of these things before in this way must have been quite a devastating experience i wonder yeah um yeah i suppose absolutely but the other side of it i think as you said earlier the other side of um you know these big festivals these four day dionysian festivals or was kind of to you know to control um to control the people mm. you know to you know if you think of or if you think of the women in these classic greek plays they're all um they're all incredibly articulate they're outspoken they're they're transgressive yeah and it's hard not yeah. to see them as cautionary tales you know like how not to be how mm. not to behave and it's interesting as well that they're all outsiders uh like the uh Clytemestra's uh Spartan uh Jocasta uh and Antigone are Thebans like none of them are Athenians none of these transgressive women like Medea um Hecuba um Electra you know they're all they're all not from Athens mm-hmm. and they're all very badly behaved um and it it's hard not to see uh something in the plays whether unconsciously or not uh showing showing the, it'll be the men and the boys because the women wouldn't have been at the plays showing the men and the boys like this is not uh this behavior is not acceptable mm. um i i think it's yeah it's, it's difficult i think there was you know, So the, there's so much around the classics about how wonderful the whole Athenian democracy was. I don't find it so wonderful, I have to say. I mean, I think it was an experiment. It didn't last very long. It was wonderful um, for, for certain members of the society, but it wasn't wonderful at all for, for many others, for slaves, women and children. Um, and I think the plays are, are posited somewhere within that argument as well mm. um and it's it, it's uh you know i think they the big three tragedians i think they they are certainly questioning um 
this democracy and this idea of, of uh, this invincible new world where man is the measure of all things. I mean, it's one of the big things in Oedipus, isn't it? Yeah. We don't need the gods anymore. We're, we're past them. Um, we, we are the new gods, which is really the thesis of, um, of uh, the Athenians at the time and, and reason, uh, how, they, how they rated reason and how they uh, rated physical beauty and physical strength. But all of these um, attributes were things that were considered beautiful in men, but not beautiful in women. You know, this mm -hmm. idea, this idea of art, being articulate, being eloquent, um, was the opposite of, of their ideal of what a woman should be. And I just find that very interesting and, and what we've carried. I remember talking uh, to someone once and she was telling me, she was talking to me about the Oristia and the, um, where Clytemestra's killing is not, a, where Orestes is not punished for the killing of his mother hmm. and how the law, I think it comes down and how the law begins after Orestes is, is let go because Athena um, decides she she's the, has the vote and she decides that she's not going to punish him, not because what he did was uh, right, but because the, the bloodletting has to stop somewhere and the law has to begin. Yeah. And this person said to me, but imagine if if the law began after uh, Orestes was punished for, for the killing of his mother. Hmm. So what basically what has been said, I think basically the, the message going out with uh, uh, in the RS style with, with not the pun not punishing Orestes is that it's not OK. It's not OK to kill anyone, but if you must kill someone, it's a little bit more OK to kill a woman. Yeah. Um, you could read it like that. Um, yes. Yes. But the law began after that. What would that have meant for for the way women inhabit the world, the way men inhabit the world? As we are carrying, we're carrying Athens with us still in terms of the law. So women are still not equal under the law. Um, and it's not that anyone wants Orestes punished for killing his mother. I think it's a philosophical point that mm -hmm. where, where the law begins, the decision where they decide to introduce the law. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. a fascinating, it's a fascinating one that I'm very curious to see a production. Well, I mean, you don't see many productions of it anyway, but I, but I'd be very curious to see if she went the other way at the end of that play, just what that, but I suppose you would need to know, you would need to know in yeah. order for it to have an impact on an audience now. But mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've often thought about that idea and where the, you know, what they decided was the, the thing that tipped it in his favor. You know, what was the thing that she did that was slightly worse uh, because I'm more interested in it not being a straightforward. Well, she's a yeah. woman. And we know what we know about women in mm -hmm. that society and what we know about how how women fe featured and and mm. treated and owned and possessed and all of that. But I'm really interested in you know whether it's because she made him step on the the cloak, the, the claret cloak or the purple cloak or what, 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 you know, if, if we, if I knew a little bit more, what are the huge offenses? What mm. are the things that really to that audience at that time that I, that I don't know enough about? And you probably know mm -hmm. more about, but um, what are the things? Sorry, Helen, you you've come back to shut me up. Absolutely, good to see so, you. Um, you. But what are what what are the? Because the killings, the killings in that trilogy, you know, all, uh, kind of almost balance each other out in the end. Mm. Well, it's kind of fascinating because the Furies, their whole thesis is, you know, blood is blood. So 
so Orestes killing his mother is a greater crime than than Clytemestra killing Agamemnon mm. because he's not her blood but Agamemnon killing their daughter because yeah. it's dread because Iphigenia is his blood yeah. um so it's that cycle and I mean whatever way you look at it Orestes doesn't stand a chance because he's he has to revenge his father because uh someone has killed his blood his mother and then um, Clytemestra has to kill Agamemnon because he has killed their daughter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it just goes on and on and on. And then... Um, but would he, have then it, would he have killed his father for killing his sister if his mom didn't do it first? That's what I want to know. <laughs> it's a really interesting question, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's a yeah. very, very interesting question. I, I think not enough attention is paid to Clytemnestra's suffering, you know, her, the trauma of her going mm. uh, to, to see the ships, you know, setting sail for Troy and then that, that her daughter has to be sacrificed in front of her eyes. I mean, that is extraordinary. And it's, it reminds me a bit, Marina, of your portrayal of Hecuba last year in, that I saw in, in the Rough mm. Magics production that Hecuba also has to witness the killing of her her child, her children, and that. The, 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 Licks, it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is, an, yeah, in a similar sort of ritualized way, Polixena, you know, in front of the armies and all of that. And that, 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 that's something that is very, very hard to, for us to conceive of, you know, and, and, yeah. and. Lasso I, talks about that. He talks about, you know, the, the war to try being book, bookended by the killing of, of girls. So yeah. it, it begins with Iphigenia and it ends with Polixena. And exactly. I just think that's a fascinating it, idea to put that together. Yeah. A and sacrifice of a virgin girl. Um, totally, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to come back before, just to, to, before we, just to pull a few things together. The, the, you, were, you were talking, Katrina, about the chorus um, and uh, their function and I and, and also I, I wanted to link this a bit to to Marina your your use of humor because we've been talking a lot about obviously tragedy and terrible things incest and, and abuse and, and death mm. and so on and cycles of tragedy but but actually even within that in your work you often have very very black humor and and that I wondered was that a, a, a sort of a bit like Katrina was saying about the chorus it's kind of a a little bit of a step back, a kind of a relief, a, a, a safety valve uh, from the from the intensity, I suppose, of what's mm -hmm. happening what's happening in the drama. I never try. I never, I never aim to be funny, but um, because I, anytime I try, I fall flat on my face. But it seems that <laughs> um, it comes out, <laughs> comes out. And the things I don't find funny at all, others find hilarious. So there's no there's no accounting for people's sense of humor, I suppose. Um, things I find bizarre, others don't find bizarre. Um, it's it's certainly not an attempt with the chorus, but I mean, but one of the things I was amazed at when I did my riff on Hecuba, and people were saying, "Oh, they're all each other's choruses," and I was like, "Are they really? I don't think they are." Um, but this was kind of one of the, this was some of the commentary around it. And then I said, well, okay, I'll, you know, I'll accept that if that's what people are, are thinking. Um, but as far as they were narrating, they were switching between narration of the events and then actual first person uh, sort of uh, embodiment. So there were kind of, there was a, there was a shift in perspective mm. in the way you wrote the characters. Maybe that's mm. what people were referring to. Do you know what I find found about Hecuba that I thought was brilliant was that actual device did the same thing. The enormity of the subject is very hard to play in in first person. Yeah. Um, yeah. You you know you couldn't tackle that. You need a, a, a separation, a distancing, or a disruption from the huge emotion of it. So. Maybe in that way, I'm holding on to my disruptive chorus, <laughs> but maybe in that way, it also reflects the chorus in that it 
it gives us the capacity to receive what we're hearing without being overwhelmed by grief or by fear or by anger or by the emotions that because I found that that play and I thought that was a brilliant production by Lynn Parker. I found it incredibly overwhelming, the size of the story we were hearing. It found it emotionally very, very disturbing in a great way, in a, in a rare way, you know? And I don't know if, I, if anyone could ever play it or if anyone could watch it unless there was something like, like that device Marina used to separate us from it. Mm. You see, I would thank you, Katrina. I'm glad it worked for you. But I would see that because what I what I was after was a kind of an interior expression of just what's happening all around them. So for me, that was to actually uh, bring us closer to the story, or to bring myself closer to the story, to try and articulate the story through the eyes of each of the characters. Mm. Um, and it's very interesting that it had kind of the opposite effect because that wasn't my intention, which is Oh, oh no, I, I don't, I, I actually don't mean that. I think it kept us with and, and in the story because I, mm. I, I, feel, I feel it actually totally achieved that. But what I meant is it, it enabled us to stay with the story rather than because yeah. because the slaughter of the children and that those that I mean the description the description and not and and I suppose too when I watched it I wasn't sure how much of it was in the play and how much of it was in the production because it was we didn't have to see too much I now know it's all you know it's all in the writing mm -hmm. um but I think it made us, it did bring us into the play, absolutely brought us into the play <clears throat> and not have us be overwhelmed by moments in the play that would have distracted us is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always a difficult question, isn't it? How do you, how do you show the tragic moment on stage? Um, you know, there's a reason for <laughs> obscene you know off stage and then wheel them on in the the clamia or is that how you pronounce it you know the, the bodies are yeah. and the and the usual the, the messenger speech describing the terrible thing yeah uh, yeah and I, I love i love that in the aristia you know the the Claiming, you know, after Clytemester has gone off and murdered Agamemnon in the bath, and the next thing you see, the doors open, and this mm -hmm. kind of, the, you know, the, this thing on wheels, and there he is in the bath, dead, with the net over him, and she's there with, with her double-edged axe, and and, um, and Cassandra is like, you know, draped over the bath, dead as well, and she's absolutely unapologetic. Yeah. She's this speech about, yeah, this is why I did it. This is why I pretended. And she goes on and on. She kind of goes for the chorus and she goes for the audience. Um, I mean, it's thrilling stuff. It, it is so, it's so kind of shocking. It's still shocking. Mm. When you read that scene, when she comes back on, you know. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. I think, I think we, we will leave Clytemnestra with the bodies and her her speech, uh, I think it, it might be a, a a high a high a high note um, on which to to draw this conversation uh, about Greek tragedy and myth uh, to a close. We could probably talk all night. It's, the night is falling, <laughs> and uh, um, I I'm just fascinated now, Marina, to see the boy to see what you've done what you what we will see eventually with with the oedipus story and which as you say is just so remarkable for that sense of what we know in our subconscious or our unconscious maybe which i suppose is why it was of such fascination to freud um so i'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it and i know and to, the two of you will be working on it we hope next year um, I can't wait just to get back into the theatre anyway, but, but particularly for that, it's going to be such a treat. And I feel like we've had a lovely, uh, a sort of a prelude to it in this conversation today. So I want to thank the two of you for giving it such 
thought and consideration uh, and for your time today. So um, and I'd like to, on behalf of Classics Now, thank you uh, for watching. There are lots of other uh, events on our website, classicsnow.ie, with plenty of other discussion about Greek myth, including from Natalie Haynes on her new book, Pandora's Jar. But so please um, have a good look and see what else you might like to watch. Um, and, um, and thank you for joining us. Um, good night. <laughs>